Throughout many of our stories on historical geopolitics, a recurring presence is that of Cossack brigades. The Cossacks are one of the most unique and interesting groups to study, both historically and in present day. A fiercely independent people, yet historically intertwined with the Russian Empire, will take a look at their origins, their brief de facto independence, and the eventual start of that long relationship with the Russian Tsardom. We'll explore all of that coming up in one of our next videos, especially with world geopolitical attention now focusing on the Eastern Slavic lands. And there'll of course also be a video coming up about the current situation, delving into the history of warfare between Russia and Ukraine since 2014. However, today I wanted to discuss a topic that I first touched on in our video about the Iran crisis and the history of foreign powers in Tabriz in northern Iran, that being the Persian Cossack Brigades. The brigades were first formed from an unlikely group, consisting mainly of Circassian exiled elements which had fled from the major ethnic clashes taking place in the Kuban and the Northwest Caucasus throughout the middle of the 19th century between the largely fleeing Circassians and the expanding Russians. Despite fleeing from the Russian Cossack hosts of the Caucasus, the Circassians were recruited along with some Persians and limited numbers of Azeris to serve in the new brigade, which would mainly be utilized for internal security. It was established in 1879 by the reigning Shah Nasir al-Din of Qajar. The Qajar dynasty had lost a pair of wars to the Russian Empire earlier in the century, and the Persian state struggled mightily to field a centralized military force, both for internal and external security. After traveling through the Russian Caucasus and the Cossack hosts of the region a year earlier in 1878, the Shah was extremely impressed with the horse warriors' valor and discipline, especially in comparison to the Shah's own Royal Cavalry Unit, which was widely cited as lacking proper training and discipline. So in April of 1879, the Shah's request to the Russians was approved by Tsar Alexander II, and he sent Kuban Cossack and Russian General Alexei Domantovich to assist the Shah's government government in setting up the new force, consisting again mainly of Circassians exiled to Persia, along with some Persians and a few Azeris, the unit would continue to be led by Russian officers, eventually developing into an agent of Russian influence within Persia, but also a force loyal to the Shah, whose interests internally and externally were guaranteed by Russia and Britain. In 1895, the Circassian elements would mutiny. However, a compromise agreement was reached which resulted in the reunification of the brigade. The next year after the Shah's death, chaos erupted in Tehran over the succession. However, the Persian Cossack brigades would, for the first but not the last time, play kingmaker and allowed Mozaffar ad-Din of Qajar to ascend to the throne. However, the new Shah would prove to be unpopular, eventually leading to a revolutionary yet classicalist and moderate constitutional movement. The Constitutional Revolution sprang up in the first decade of the 20th century. The British would take the side of the Constitutionalists, while the Persian Cossack Brigade safeguarded the interest of the Shah on behalf of Russia. At this point, the commander of the Persian Cossack Brigades was Vladimir Lyakov, and as previously mentioned in the Iran documentary, he led the bombardment of the Persian parliament, the Majlis, in support of the Shah, leading to a siege of the building and the eventual execution of several Constitutionalist leaders. However, as as I've previously gone into, the Constitutionalists continued their agitation and eventually their military campaigns, forcing the Shah to flee into exile and forcing Lyakov to surrender the Persian Cossack Brigade to the Constitutional Forces. By this point, the 1,500-man strong brigade was led by 200 Russian officers, and although this was maintained for now to avoid agitating Russia, which had made an agreement with Britain just two years earlier over spheres of influence in the Persian Empire, Lyakov was sent back to Russia by the Constitutionalists and replaced by Nikolai Vodbosky. As World War I broke out, the Russians would expand the Persian Cossack Brigade to 8,000 men. During the war, the Russians expanded their already extensive holdings in northern Iran with military occupation zones throughout northwest Persia and northeast Anatolia, and the Persian Cossacks essentially becoming another pro-Russian unit in the battlefield that Persia had turned into. In 1917, the British, who, after the successful constitutional revolution, were now supporting the Persian state again, and were of course allied with Russia in the World War, took control of the Persian Cossack brigades following the Russian Revolution and installing classicalist, quote-unquote, white Russian officers at the head of the brigade, thus ensuring it both remained anti-communist and remained an ally of the British in the war. 
However, as it became clear that no classicalist Russian state was going to survive the war, the British brigades under the control of British and Persian officers and attempted to make it the one unifying force in fractured post-war Persia. Britain had recently signed a renewed agreement with the Persian government following the end of Russian influence in the country and the replacement of the Persian Cossacks' Russian officers with British ones was seen as a way of securing the agreement. However, the British wanted the new brigade commander to be a Persian. The honor went to Ray Reza Khan of Pahlavi, a standout soldier who had risen through the ranks of the Persian Cossack Brigade. He was selected by British General Edmund Ironside, who had been tasked with keeping the country under control, making the Cossacks into an effective force of centralization, and making sure that the Anglo-Persian agreement was enforced. Without permission from the foreign or colonial offices, Ironside gave Reza the green light for a coup attempt. However, for the British, this would not fully go according to plan. The coup took place in the early hours of February 21st, First, with the Cossack Brigade setting out in darkness from Tabriz and 2,500 soldiers surrounding the principal areas in Tehran. Pahlavi demanded a new cabinet in which he would be made Minister of War. However, neither Reza himself nor the new Prime Minister would be nearly as pro-British as expected. That being said, Reza understood that it was the British who had underwritten his coup, so after the new Prime Minister went rogue and declared an agreement with the Soviet Russians, Reza Khan would force him out in a power struggle and essentially solidified his place at the top of the Persian government in all but name. Due to the extreme weakness shown by the Tehran government in its northern and northwestern areas during the previous two decades, and also due to the large non-ethnic Persian populations of the region, these areas had become ripe for breakaway states. One of these was the Jengali Communist Movement in Gilan, with the organic movement having actually been replaced by a Soviet-approved coup to install more pro-Moscow hardline communists in the administration, including the future president of the breakaway Azeri state in 1945 and 46, Saeed Jafar Peshavari, who was a cabinet minister in the new Soviet-aligned government of the Persian Soviet Republic. However, like in 1946, despite being installed by Moscow, this cabinet was later sold out in an agreement with the Persians in which the Soviet Russians agreed not to bolster the Persian Soviet Republic with the Red Army's military forces. The British wanted Reza Khan to crush the communists and use his newfound powers as Minister of War to bolster the Persian state, which would only be an effective client for the British if it could maintain its own authority and assert centralized control over the historically autonomous areas which often formed the basis for these breakaway states and foreign occupations. Pahlavi would follow through on this in October of 1921 when he invaded Gilan and captured Rasht, ending the Persian Soviet Republic. Peshavari would stay in the country, though he would eventually be arrested by Persian forces for continued agitation before being released during the Soviet occupation of the northern part of the country in 1941 and subsequently put in charge of the new breakaway republic in Tabriz. Pahlavi would move quickly to ensure the continuation of Persia's newfound security and also to build an apparatus which would be able to eliminate any future breakaway attempts without allowing them to fester. He would accomplish this by making the Persian Cossack Brigade his home for numerous years, a unit that had allowed him to rise to prominence, but also one of the few effective centralizing forces in the country, the basis for a new Persian army, a centralized national force in the European style, which would be initially composed by merging the only two effective centralized military forces in the country, both at least partially led by European officers, the Persian Cossack Brigades, which of course was no longer commanded by the Russians and was now in Pahlavi's control, but still had British officers present throughout its ranks, and the Persian Central Gendarme, led by Swedish officers. There would be no more British or Swedish officers commanding these men. However, these highly trained professional forces would be merged into a new Iranian army, which would now be led by Persian officers, many of whom were personal favorites of Pahlavi. Thus, from then on, the Iranian Imperial Army now bore the image and likeness of the Persian Cossack Brigades, which no longer officially existed, but essentially had their legacy carried on by the new Iranian army, just as the tradition of the Swedish-led gendarme were continued on by the new army's gendarme units. With the Shah essentially having been totally sidelined by Pahlavi's coup, he found himself increasingly unpopular and at odds with Pahlavi, fleeing to exile in Europe for nominal health reasons in 1923. Pahlavi's new army would get its first test in October of 1923, 
February, Sheikh Khazal al Kabi had proclaimed the independence of the Emirate of Arabistan in the Arab-majority Khuzestan region of Iran's southwest. Because of some of the unexpected difficulties the British were having in their relations with Pahlavi, within some British circles supporting a new uprising by Sheikh Khazal to overthrow the British-installed Pahlavi was gaining traction, with the rebellion itself being a potential indication that Pahlavi could not protect central authority, thus putting British interests in the same risk they'd been in prior to Pahlavi's coup. However, Pahlavi was determined to not let that become a reality. With the Shah in exile, Pahlavi was essentially the regent of the country, and had even begun to be referred to by the style His Serene Highness, despite being a civilian. Reza Khan and his supporters at first speculated about the idea of creating a republic with Reza Khan Pahlavi as president, but Islamic religious leaders caused this idea to be dropped. However, of course, he and his son would later reduce the role of these Islamic clerics as part of a Persianization program that also included dress codes for men and women that ran contrary to Islam, in addition to the Pahlavi name itself, which Reza Khan had given himself in 1919 and which referenced a language from Persia's pre-Islamic Sasanian era. This Persianization and de-emphasis of Islam under the Pahlavi dynasty would become a main backdrop for the clerical revolution of 1979. In early 1925, Pahlavi's new Persian Cossack-inspired army crushed the Arabistan uprising, and although in the aftermath Sheikh Khazal had retained his local authority and now recognized the central government in Tehran, Pahlavi ordered the new army gendarme units to board Sheikh Khazal's yacht and arrest him, proving once again to the British and to the world who the new authority in Tehran was. On October 25th, the Shah's exile was made permanent as he was deposed from the throne officially. It would remain vacant for a couple of months, but eventually the British would encourage the newly strengthened Pahlavi to declare a new imperial dynasty under his own house. On December 12th, he was officially elected, and on December 15th, he was officially crowned Shah An Shah, King of Kings, Emperor of Persia. The coronation would be held in April of the next year, and would mark the first change in Persian imperial dynasties since the 18th century. The new imperial state of Persia would continue to be served for decades by this imperial army, created in the image of the Persian Cossacks. This is not only an interesting and unique unit in Cossack history, but also a very consequential unit in this period of geopolitical history. Thank you so much for checking it out. If you like this content, make sure to check out our other videos. Like, subscribe, and comment. That helps the algorithm. If you can, donate on Patreon. And check out the project that forms the basis for all of these videos at apoliticalworldmap.org. Thank you for watching. I'm Alex. I am out.